Greetings, friends, and welcome to another ministry of the Victory Hour. My name is Jim Gallagher. I'm the pastor at Clavel Assembly, who is responsible for bringing to you this YouTube channel. And welcome to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to contact me, my email is info at clavelassembly.com. You can snail mail me, too. <laughs> the Victory Hour, P.O. Box 222, Foster, Rhode Island, 02825. Or you can send it to same address, but entitled it Clavel Assembly. It doesn't matter either way. Clavel Assembly, P.O. Box 222, Foster, Rhode Island, 02825. We have a P.O. Box at Clavel because we're out in the sticks. And I don't like the mail sitting in a mailbox at the building because I only go to the building like just on Sundays. And then it just sits there the whole week. So I, I pick it up at the post office. That's why we have that. But you can contact me. Clavel Assembly, P.O. Box 222, Foster, Rhode Island, 02825. All right, so uh, I'm, I'm back to the series on what the apostles' teaching, be it directly or indirectly, of Christ's coming necessarily taking place within the first century, within the lifetime of many of the people that were then living 2,000 years ago. And we've gone quite a ways in this. Now, I want to make an announcement, though. Because I took a... I took two days of a break from this series on the Apostles' teaching on eschatology. I took two-day break to answer a question given by Doug. And Doug had a follow-up question. Now, I'm not favoring Doug. I mean, I don't know who he, I don't know who he, who he is. <laughs> but... Um, um, some questions, they just seem nonsensical or they're silly. Uh, and some questions, they're not silly, but I, I know that I'm going to get to them anyway. Um, and some, okay, I will get to them at some point, but they're not really that important, particularly at this point. I, I can't answer everybody, but because I was talking to Doug, um, I saw another question he followed up with that I do want to answer. I'm going to read it for you. Um... Okay, yeah, he says, uh, he thanks me for getting back to him and answering his question, his first question. Um, but then he has a follow-up here. He says, I wanted to ask you uh, a question about the resurrection. You said we are raised with a spiritual body. Are we not raised in glorification the same way as our Savior? I can tell you, my... Answer would be yes, but you've got to understand that. If this is true, then what body was Jesus raised with? It's a very natural question. Was it not a spiritual body? Not just a spirit, but a spiritual body. And he puts in parentheses glorification. A glorified body that could eat, drink, go through walls, etc., but also a physical human body, see conversation with Thomas. A body that will never see decay. Okay, so that's his question. And uh, I responded to him, and I'm just going to read you my response. <laughs> um, I said, you know what, Doug? I'll take a little time to address your question here, the second question as well. I think people might need a little dose of how can this be to tie them over until I get to that part of the series where we're talking about how is all the things you say impossible? I mean, we can see it in the text, but, you know, I know people are waiting for that, but there's, I've still got more verses to prove that it's everywhere in the New Testament that Jesus would return in the first century. I want to inundate. But I'll take another little one or two day break to answer Doug's question here. Um, I said, but I have a way to go on the teaching of the apostles on Christ's first century return. So let me give everyone something to hold them over a little bit until we reach the how can all this be true phase. So, so the, I will take, I'll do two more postings. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what it, it says it right here. So here's what I'll do. I'll go back and do two or three more postings in the current series on the Apostles' teaching of Christ's first century return. And then I'll take another break for one or two days to explain Christ's resurrection and its relation to the resurrection of the believer in 70 AD, and a little bit about our own eternal bodies as well in this new covenant age. And then I, 
I just cried uncle. Okay, <laughs> I'll do that. Now, I just thought it'd be useful for, you know, not just for Doug's sake, but uh, lots of people's sake to, you know, hold, you know, hold on now. Hold on. Don't worry. It'll all work out. So what I'll do is today and the next posting will be uh, more, uh, more verses. This will be part five on what the apostles taught about Christ coming in the first century. And then I'll do, the next one will be part six, what the apostles taught about Christ coming in the first century. And when it won't be done then, I can tell you that, we'll take a break again and then take a day or two to talk about the resurrection body just to hold you over until we get to the how-to section. Okay, that's what we're going to do. And I think it uh, it'll be profitable for all concerned. That's why I'm responding to Doug, because I think, you know, it just made me think, well, give them something uh, a little bit here, okay? It's amazing, though. You read some people's... Uh, let's see, I don't even know if it's here. Maybe it was another video. Uh, some objections are... Uh, they get kind of worked up, but they're kind of comical. <laughs> okay, it's not this one. It must be the other one. Uh, uh, well, let's see. Hold on here. Wait a minute. Maybe if I hit the replies to him... Now, okay, well, that's what we're going to be doing. So we got to get down to business here today uh, and not worry about what I'm going to be doing a couple days from now. Well, a week from now, right? <laughs> after after today and the next posting. So where did we left off? Well, we actually left off in Hebrews 10.37. And uh, I won't belabor that because we did talk about that at the very end of the last uh, posting. But the apostle writes, for yet a little while, I know what I wanted to mention. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to mention that someone in one of the uh, mo recent videos, their comment was, well, um, when Jesus said he was going to come back before everyone would die, that he was going to be coming back soon, he was talking about the day of Pentecost. Jesus came back as the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus, is, and, the, and the guy writes as though, well, duh, I don't realize the Trinity and that Jesus is one with the Holy Spirit. But where did he get that idea from? Where did that idea come from? I believe God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All one. Three are one. Explain it. Can't. I just believe it because the Bible says so. End of story. So I don't have a problem with the doctrine of the Trinity. But uh, this fellow saying, whoever it was, uh, they said, well, uh, uh, Christ came back um, in his kingdom uh, at, at Pentecost. That was Christ coming back to dwell in his people. And I don't really have a problem with that understanding in and of itself. You know, Christ in you, the hope of glory. How can Christ be in us? Through the person of the Holy Spirit. I agree with that principle. I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't explain... If we want to go back and look at all these texts, now all these texts that talk about his coming sooner in this generation, is that all talking about Christ coming at the day of Pentecost? I mean, if I can... Let me take the little, little bit of time to answer that here. I mean, I mean, think of some of these verses, right? John the Baptist said... That the uh, uh, who hath warned you to flee the wrath to come? The wrath was about to come, and now also the axe is laid at the root of the trees. This is Matthew three, verse seven and ten. Then in verse twelve, whose fan? That's a winnowing fork. That's a harvest too. Whose fan is in his hand? He's talking about judgment and wrath. A winnowing fork, the harvest. That's not Pentecost. It's just not Pentecost. Um, Jesus said this generation will not pass till all these things be fulfilled. In Matthew 24, Jesus was not prophesying about Pentecost. Um, <laughs> Romans 13, 11 and 12. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. He can't be talking about Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was already given by the time Paul was writing the uh, the epistle to the Romans. We were, they weren't waiting for the Holy Spirit to fall on them on the day of Pentecost. That's in the past. 
The day is at hand. The night is far spent. We've gone through most of the waiting period. It's just a little bit of time left. The day is at hand. That's not Pentecost. <laughs> uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 29. But this I say, the time is short. <laughs> what, for Pentecost? No, it was in the past when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. Oh, 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 31. 7, 31. For the foundation of this world passeth away. Uh, this is just applies to all of them. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. They are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Well, the ends of the world didn't come on the day of Pentecost, which was past when Paul wrote that. Well, I can't, you know, I'm not going to reread all of these. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15. That we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord. Well, he's not talking about his coming at Pentecost, but Paul believed that some of them would still, and he taught under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that some of them would still be alive and remain at the Lord's coming, not coming at Pentecost. That already happened when Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians 4.15. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Paul knew that that day, the day of the Lord, of his parousia coming, not Pentecost, that day was going to fall within the lifetime of some of Paul's readers to this letter to the Thessalonians. He says that day shouldn't come to overtake you as a thief, because you know better. The clear implication is he would come in the lifetime of some of the brethren still living at Thessalonica when he wrote that epistle. Ay, 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 ay. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go through all these. The, the, every, every verse I've gone through so far, which is a lot. We see, what do we got? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then you got 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. I could do this with all 26. Maybe there's a couple in the, in the Gospels, because it's before Pentecost, that someone could make that mistake. But after that, there's no excuse anymore. And what shall ye do? All right, so we stopped at um, uh, Hebrews 10.37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come, that can't be Pentecost, because that's in the past, from the time of the writing of Hebrews. All right? He that shall come will come and will not tarry. But Peter says he's delayed. Yes, within the context of the generation he said he would come in. He said he would come in that generation in a lifetime of, of some that were still living. So you've got a generation, about 40 years. But that could mean he'd come five years later. But no, he came 40 years later. He came at the outer end of what he predicted, but he, but Hebrews 10.37, saying where he will not tarry, is not a contradiction to what Peter said. Well, yes, he will tarry. So the apostle in Hebrews says, no, he won't tarry. Then Peter says, yes, he will tarry. So what are they supposed to do? Duke it out in the streets? <laughs> scripture doesn't contradict Scripture. So Peter was right. He tarried within the context of the time frame that he authoritatively declared he would come in. Yet no man would know the day or the hour. See, not that difficult to understand if you just start with the premise, all these verses have to be true. And then they begin to meld together and you realize there's a unified message. That's what I want you to see. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now, if he hasn't come yet, 2,000 years later, he hasn't come yet. If that's not tarrying, well, you don't understand. A day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Yeah, but here's the problem. The Lord isn't writing to himself. If he was thinking to himself, he said, yeah, it'll be like, you know, no time flat. Two thousand years. But he wasn't writing to himself. He wasn't thinking to himself. He was, the, the, those scriptures were given to human beings to read 2,000 years ago. And when he said, 
that he would not tarry to the Hebrew audience 2,000 years ago. He knew how they would understand that, and he would not speak deceptively in that regard. Nor would he contradict all these other scriptures. See, you got to go line upon line, precept upon precept, but you got to believe all these texts by faith. The just shall live by faith. All right, so let's move on to some new ones, right? It's about time we get to it. We're halfway through. We haven't even got to a new one yet. Let's see. Uh, how about James 5? It's just a simple one. James 5. Just a simple one. We won't belabor this one. James 5. Um, and verse 8. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. What coming of the Lord is that? It can't be the day of Pentecost. That was long before James wrote this epistle. What does it mean, the day of the Lord draweth nigh? You know what draweth nigh means. We don't have to go into a Greek study. We could. I don't see the sense. How desperate must we be? Well, there's a lot of people that are desperate. They feel like their faith is just falling apart all around them by listening to me. No, no, you've got to trust the Lord. Don't trust me. Trust the Lord. Trust his word. Did he say that? Yes, he did. Then it must be true. Correct. What's the sense in preserving a faith if your faith requires that you don't trust him? And you don't trust his word. Doesn't seem to make sense, does it, to do that? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Yeah, so, you know, James 5, 8. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. In fact, the verse, I'll read the verse before it. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. See, he's expecting them to continue to be patient right up until he comes, which means he's expecting his audience right into the 12 tribes 2,000 years ago. He's expecting his audience, or at least some of them, to still be alive. But that's okay. Be patient in your tribulation. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, up until he comes. Behold, the husbandmen waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. <laughs> Yield to the authority of God's word, and pieces will start to come together. Fight against it. Dance around the bond. Put your blinders on. I can't see what's there. No, that's not there. Say, yes, it is. Open your eyes. No, no, it's not there. Now, if that's the kind of faith you want to have, you're always, you're always going to have gnawing doubts. Gnawing doubts. And when the true time of testing and tribulation comes into your life, maybe you get older and um, your wife or your husband falls deathly ill and you're scared. And you pray to the Lord for a healing. Somewhere in the back of your mind, you remember that series from Pastor Gallagher that you fought against. You said, he's a liar. He's a false teacher. He's ignorant, obviously. And all these excuses. And, and, um, but you knew what I was saying was right. You just couldn't comprehend how it could be, so you just fought it. So you've been having doubts about your faith all this time, but you've maintained it. Now the true time of testing comes. And with those doubts, that won't give you the boldness and confidence of faith you're going to need. Trust the Lord. It always pays off to trust the Lord. Always.
All right, that was James 5, 7, and 8. What else we got for you? Well, how about 1 Peter 4? 1 Peter 4. And verse 5. Well, I got to read 4 for a little context here. Wherein they think, well, let me back up to 3. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, be, uh, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Who shall give an account to him that is ready. He's in readiness. He's ready to judge the quick and the dead. Well, if Christ was in readiness 2,000 years ago when Peter wrote this, then we're still thinking, and there he is, still ready, about to do what he said he was going to do, and 2,000 years later, he still hasn't done it. That's no different than what John the Baptist said. The winnowing fork, the fin, was already in his hand. That's a harvest tool. No one's going to argue that. The harvest takes place at the parousia. No one's going to argue that. Well, if the harvest tool is in his hands, and 2,000 years later, he hasn't done anything with it, well, I got to tell you, Jesus is not a state worker. You know, they're filling potholes. <laughs> and there's four guys. There's one guy taking the shovel, and sticking it in the back of the truck, and putting that tar in the hole. And there's three or four other guys standing around leaning on shovels watching them. <laughs> you know, government work. You know, you know. I'm sorry, but that's not Jesus. If he picks up the harvest tool, that's because he intends to use it. He doesn't work for the state. <laughs> you gotta have a little humor with this. And there's nothing funny about God's word. But we human beings, well, yeah, we can be a little ridiculous at times. You got to laugh at yourself and then sober up and say, you know what, Pastor, you're right. Well, it's not about me being right. It's about, is Peter right? Is Peter right? <laughs> yeah, I think he is. The Lord... 2,000 years ago, was ready. He was in a state of readiness to judge the quick and the dead. Now, I want to read um, verse 8. Where am I here? Oh, yeah, 5. But I want to read 7, so let me keep reading. Verse 6. For, for, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God and the Spirit. But the, now verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober. Why be sober? Because the end of all things is at hand. I mean, you know, you got to deal with it. Verse 7, 1 Peter 4, verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. Watch what? Watch the cars go by. I can see the cars when they go by in my street. I live in a very rural area. They don't go by too often. But that's not what he's talking about. What are they watching for? His coming. The end of all things, which takes place at his coming. You say, Pastor, do you believe the end of all things came 2,000 years ago? Yes. Well, how can you say that? The world is still out there. Because he wasn't talking about the existence of planet Earth. You've read that into it contrary to the teaching of Scripture. I will show you that when we get to it. We'll have a series on the new heavens and new earth. And it'll be an eye-opener. 
It really will. Maybe that'll be one of the first things I do when we get into the How series. I don't know. We have to talk about apocalyptic language. I know we have to do that first. So Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer because the end of all things, the coming of Christ and the judgment is at hand. Not that difficult. I'm exegeting the text. If you disagree with me, don't say, well, what about this passage over here, this passage over there? I'm not talking about those passages. You have a problem with what I'm saying? Tell me how that doesn't mean what I just said it means. It means that the end of all things is near. 2,000 years, if not near. Well, Peter says a day is like a thousand years. No. God inspired what Peter wrote for the purpose of human beings reading it. Not God himself. For you and I, he's saying this to you and I, and more specifically to the folks that Peter was writing to 2,000 years ago. And in saying it to them, when he says the end of all things is at hand, the Lord knows how they're going to understand that. And you and I do too. And it has to be true because God said it to them. You want to move on? You say, yeah, hurry up and get off this one. Wait, you think it's going to get better? Oh, no. I'll tell you, there's some blockbusters coming up here. All right, so, okay, I gave you... Um, 1 Peter 4, 5. 1 Peter 4, 7. All right, let's see. Okay, all right. Well, okay, how about 2 Peter 2? 2 Peter 2 and verse 3. 2 Peter 2, verse 3. Now, uh, 2 Peter 2, 3. And through covetousness... <laughs> Hamana, 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 Hamana. Do you ever watch, uh, what was that old program? Um, Dick Van Dyke Show, right? <laughs> Rob Petrie. This is back in like the 60s, right? Rob Petrie, he, and when, he, when he got confused or he, he got caught telling a white lie or something or he's trying to hide something from his wife and he just said, uh, Hamana, 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 Hamana. <laughs> What's that got to do with what we're talking about? <clears throat> See, I, I love God's word, so, you know, I have a little fun reading it. The scriptures are serious. But we are ridiculous. You know, I can't help but noticing the contrast. All right, so what am I doing? I'm doing uh, <laughs> Second Peter 2, 3. Yeah. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. Oh. Now, <laughs> you know, their judgment has been waiting for a long time. However, Peter says, whose judgment now of a long time Lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. It's coming soon. Does this, by the way, is this talking about the day of Pentecost? I don't think so. Judgment and damnation. That's not the day of Pentecost. You want to play make-believe? Go ahead. I don't advise it. I say, instead of make-believe, how about believe our Lord? And the apostles only wrote that which was given them of the Holy Ghost. 
what Peter writes is the word of the Lord. They are the words of Christ. Just like the Psalms. We sing the Psalms. The Psalms are the words of Christ. This is inspired scripture. Now, if you don't believe in inspiration, then you're going to discount it. Well, go ahead. You do that. But that's not where I'm coming from. Now, oh, my time's up. I just came to a doozy. We come back the next one. Oh, boy. You better hold on to your seats. Ask your mommy to pray for you. That you just not, you know, fall apart in dismay and discouragement. There's no need to fall apart in dismay and discouragement. I'm telling you right now, trust God's word. Trust him. I've got to go. Jim Gallagher reminding you in the words of your, our blessed Lord and Savior. I hope he is your Lord and Savior as well. This is Jim Gallagher reminding you in the blessed words of our Lord and Savior, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.